Nitrogen cycling, salinity management in Vietnam, and the formation and management of soil acidity in Australia, in Australian crop and pasture systems. And uh, he's going to talk to us a little about soil testing. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks uh, everyone for coming along. And um, going to talk to you about soil testing, which um, a lot of nothing's going to be new. But what I want to do is just bring it back front of mind. So uh, because it's important, we need to get it right. Why is that not working? Where am I pointing that to? Computer at the back or? Yep. So when it comes to soil sampling, we know, we know the rules, right? We, we know how it's done. First, we take a soil sample. We get results back from a lab. We compare that to a critical value or a target that comes from maybe our own experience. Um, or, or a local you know, geographical rule. Based on that, we then make a fertiliser recommendation or ameliorate to improve the soil to, to remove the constraint to our production. So the rules. Take a representative soil sample. Easy thing to say. What does it really mean? So um, within paddocks, you have variability. We need to be able to take samples which... Uh, represent an area that's large enough for you to manage separately. And that might be zones within a paddock if you know that there is a good part and a bad part and I'm yet to meet a farmer that you can't stand in a paddock with and they can't tell you where the good bits are and where the bad bits are or where in a dry spring, you know, things hay off early. They know their variability. You can get a lot of imagery from satellites as well to find that. But to give you an idea of... Um, how that variability can be accounted for in our sampling, I want to show you an example. So this is soil pH data, 0 to 10 sampling from 50 randomly allocated sites within a paddock that was used for grazing. So a uniform paddock, 50, 50 cores that we, we just number 1 to 50. So there's the data. And what we then you are going to do now is take randomly those sites and bulk them, just like you would if you were taking soil cores and you bulk that into one sample that you send to a lab. So 50, 50 sites. The true mean of that, of those 50 sites is about 5, 5.04. And if you were to plot that out, so on our y-axis here we've got soil pH and the mean, just over 5, there it is. Now there's error around that mean. And that error looks like that. So the absolute God's honest truth mean fits within that pink band. And mathematically, the mean is that black, black line. Rightio. Now, if you go and sample what we've always said and what's, what's the recommended thing to do, take 25 to 30 cores and bulk those cores and send that sample off to the lab. If you did that, so you take 25 of those sites average them, plot them out. So I'm going to do that three times. So here they are. So along the x-axis there, I've just got one, two, and three. They're like taking three 25 core samples three times from the one paddock. Now, I'm not saying you do that. Do it once, 25 cores. But if you did it three times, there's your three possible outcomes, just random chances of 25 cores and you can see that all the black dots, the means of those 24 cores, 25 cores, all fit within that pink band. So taking 25 cores randomly, average them by bulking them together and seeing off to the lab, you're going to get a number back from the lab that fits within the band of reality. Okay, so it's going to be a representative sample of what you've got. Now, life's hard and people try to make it easier by cutting corners. That's my observation, right? Now, in soil sampling land, that's often done by dropping the number of cores that you take for your sample. And so let's just have a look if you took eight cores, which I know people do do. Like, I know people who do that. So it's exactly the same data here, except that our black dots are the average of eight cores. And I've got nine examples of that. And the reason I've got nine is because 
there's actually the same amount of work in that, that there's the num same number of cores taken on this slide as the slide before. It's just that I had 23 lots of 25 and now I've got nine lots of eight. But you can see there that a lot of those black dots are falling outside the band of reality, right? So sometimes you can be lucky. So if we look at sample number one, sample number four, sample number eight, they are on or in that band of reality. So that, the, the mean that you got from those eight cores does represent reality. But then if you look at just by chance, when you took your eight cores, you were sample number three, you're a long way under reality. If you just by chance took the eight cores that got you sample number six, you're above reality. And that's just coming down to luck. And so if you were number three, and that pH is 4.75, like you think, my soil's acid, I need to add lime. You're gonna pull a lever on a management decision based on this number, which is wrong because there's only eight samples, eight cores taken. Or alternatively, you could be number six, and it's like, my pH is fine, I've got no problems here, I can grow whatever I want, and you'll have a crop failure of a sensitive, acid sensitive crop, right? So the saving money by taking, saving time by taking fewer cores costs someone dearly. Guess who that someone is? The grower, right? So let's not cut, core, cut corners by dropping out cores, because when you do that, you decrease the number of cores, you get more error. Have a look at those error bar, bars there. They're big, fat things. So the, the, you know, it just comes down to luck, which, which cores you take and whether you're going to get a number that represents reality or not. So that's why we say the number of cores you take should be 25 to 30, because you're, you're getting rid of the variability and you're getting a number that's more likely going to be representative of what you're actually got and what your plants are experiencing. The other thing to, um, to do when you're sampling is understand what you're actually trying to manage. And we're trying to manage the root zone, especially for pasture establishment, it's, it's near the surface. And so I've got a graph here going from uh, 0 to 20 centimetres along our y-axis and it's soil pH on our x-axis. Now if you do 0 to 10 soil sampling, which is what a lot of people do, uh, you'll get an average. That is the average of the soil pH in that 0 to 10. So pH isn't uniform, it, it changes as you go down the profile. And when you take a 0 to 10, you're effectively averaging whatever's happening in that 10 centimetre band and getting one number. And in this case, the number's 5.2. And if you'd limed and you come back and it's 5.2, you think, well, lime worked, I can grow whatever I want. But the reality is that pH is stratified. And so that 5.2, if you measured that in five centimetre intervals, 5.2 is the actual average of two layers, the 0 to 5, which often will have a higher pH, and then a 5 to 10, which often will have a lower pH. Okay, so your 5.2 actually has a band in there that has a pH of 4.5, which is really acid, and if you're a plant, that would bother you, and if you're microbes, that would bother you as well. So that's a limitation, that if you, if you just sampled in a 0 to 10, you don't even know that limitation's there. That's a problem. So this uh, sampling in five centimetre intervals identifies that you've got a problem that you need to address. Now that average, you can get an average many different ways. This is a blue, the blue line represents another soil, slightly higher pH in the surface, slightly more acid in the five to 10. But you could get that average, there's the green one, the average is still 5.2, but it's hideously different to the green and the blue and the red, right? So that's why we need to be looking at these five centimetre intervals. It gives you the true story of what the plant's going to experience as it grows, which is why you're sampling in the first place. We are, we are suggesting that we should be doing that to a depth of 20 centimetres, because what that gets you is the trend in those, those lines. You can see the blue and the red there, they have a different trend. The blue line's trending back towards a higher pH as you go down, which is telling us that the real problem is in around about that 10 centimetre mark, which is super common in soils. Okay, so if we're going to fix that blue soil, all we have to do is, is amend or fix down to about 10 centimetres or 12 centimetres, and then we've removed the constraint. We're in business. Whereas the red soil, it's got a problem that's trending continually downwards, and so it's a longer-term management fix because the problem exists deeper into the profile. 
But getting the five centimetre intervals to 20 centimetres gets us that definition. It gets, shows us how we're trending. So you can then work out a plan. If it was the blue one, we might even be able to apply lime and incorporate by sewing with the gear that we've already got. You might want to incorporate to that depth of say 12 centimetres with machinery that you've got in the shed already and fix the problem this year. Or if it's the, the, re the red one, then maybe it's a deep incorporation. Or it might be, okay, this is gonna be a longer term solve. This might be a 12, 15 year fix. Okay, but you know because you've got the information. By the way, other stuff is stratified. I spoke about pH, but here's Colwell P, stratified. So really, really common, higher Colwell P's in the top layer and then it drops away. And our naught to 10 again is just an average. Organic carbon, really, really stratified. Cation exchange capacity, stratified. And yet we use it, it's one of our things that we use to work out liming rates. And you know, technically we just assumed that it was the same all the way through and it's not. So we're recommending these five centimetre intervals to 20 centimetres, measure these things, uh, and you actually get equipped with a whole lot of information that's useful to you as managers to, to improve that soil or maintain it in the best uh, state possible. So that's getting the sample. The targets that we use, we just looked at soil pH, phosphorus and sulphur as the important things for pasture establishment. We're saying a uh, target pH of 5.8 in calcium chloride allows lime to move down. So you, you hit 5.8 and lime will, liming effect will move below where you put the lime. If you don't get up that high, the lime will fix the pH where you put it, but it won't move down. Phosphorus, um, what target you aim for depends on the phosphorus buffering index, which comes from your soil test as well, and, and there's a relationship for that from the literature. So on the y-axis here, we have the critical value, your target value that you need to hit, uh, and your x-axis is your phosphorus buffering index, uh, which comes from your soil test. And there's a, a nice line for Australian pastures, and so for our soils, uh, around a, a critical value of 30 is pretty common so somewhere between 35, 30 is, is super common. But just depending on where you are, what your PBO is, you can work out what your critical value needs to be. And that's to get 95% of relative yield. So um, basically how to maximise yield if P was the only constraint you were dealing with. And sulphur, our target is eight parts per million or eight milligrams per kilogram. So we've got these targets, that's, that's pretty well known. How well do we actually go at hitting these targets and maintaining the target? So I'm drawing on data here from a colleague, uh, Dave Harbison, who's a consultant up around uh, Orange. And so what uh, we have here is 355 soil tests from pasture sites with a couple of grazing uh, dual purpose crops in there as well. Uh, so 355. And let's look at these different targets. So this is soil pH. The red line represents 5.5. So if we keep the pH above 5.5, we allow the opportunity for, for the liming effect to move deeper in. And you can see there that there's bugger all points above that. So there's a lot below that. Even if you look at pH 5, there's still about half the sites are below pH 5, which we'd consider to be an acid limited site. Here's our Colwell P, the red line's at 30 as our critical value, and you can see there's an awful lot of points below that line as well. Some are above, some are well above, okay? And element, oh, sorry, plant available sulphur, red line's at eight, and you can see there's a lot of points below that as well. Sulphur's something I think we've probably forgotten about, to be fair, and uh, we need to get back on top of that. So in summary, 12%, only 12% had a pH greater than five and a half, which is what we're recommending it should be. 37 had adequate coal wall P's, something very simple that we all try to manage. Only 37 had coal wall of 30 or more. Only 11 had adequate P and S, so they're above 30 coal wall and above eight in, in sulfur, only 11%. And less than 4%, we're doing the job for P, S, N, P, H. And so on managed sites, we're actually suboptimal. This is the stuff that we can control and we're not getting it right. Part of that is because the soil's not being tested enough, like as regularly enough. 
So when establishing new pastures, the cost involved and the importance of doing it right warrants sampling, soil sampling, getting it done correctly, sampling in these five centimetre intervals, uh, so you're, you can make decisions um, that are data informed. Don't skimp on the number of cores. Um, that is not saving anyone money, it's costing growers money. Five centimetre samples to 20 centimetres, you get useful information, it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, because you only ask to be analysed soil pH, coal well P, um, cation, exchangeable cations, and that costs um, all up. That, that's less than $200 of analysis, which is a lot of information for not a lot of money. And those five semantic samples allow you to define your pH stratification, your coal well P stratification, uh, so you can make better decisions. Got to monitor your soils so you can be sure the management that you're doing is doing what you think it's doing. Although that data where we had only less than 4% actually hitting the targets that we know to exist, some of those people thought they were doing a good job. It's only when you test that you realise what your management's doing. Sometimes you're doing better than you thought, sometimes it's missing the mark. You can only, you only know if you uh, measure and monitor. So thanks, uh, everyone, and I'd just like to thank all the people that I work with. Um, it's a real team effort, and we're learning from each other all the time. So thank you. Thank you, Jason.